legislation will not only restore our competitive edge in the 21st century, but it will restore the sacred bonds of trust between America and its citizens. This legislation demonstrates our compassion for struggling American families who deserve an immigration system that puts their needs first and that puts America first. It's a really historic moment to happen today. Again, the biggest proposed change that would take place in 50 years. We're proposing to limit family-based migration to spouses and minor children. Additionally, we're establishing a new entry system that's points-based. If we can succeed on this kind of common sense, incremental reform to immigration, it might give the American people more confidence to tackle some of those more challenging issues. Change to immigration, basically the green cards that go out, putting high-skilled, ultra-high-skilled workers at the front of the line for legal immigration, a change that uh, the president's advisor on this, telling reporters, will be welcomed and pushed from the outside in. As far as a real push for change, that begins in earnest, aggressively, starting today. And I do think, you know, I just work on the policy side, but I do think that voters across the country are going to demand these kinds of changes because, again, of the effects it has on their lives and their communities, and this is overwhelmingly popular. If you look at the latest poll out today by Quinnipiac about the president's handling of immigration uh, upside down in this particular poll, will this turn all of that around? Let's bring in our panel. Michael Crowley, senior foreign affairs correspondent for Politico. Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist and syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer. Molly. Well, having a targeted, skilled, coherent immigration policy should not be controversial. This change that deals with merit-based uh, allocation of the spots that we give is, is a wise one. The only thing that's really controversial is decreasing the number of people who are allowed entry into the, com into the country. And this would do it by about half. Yeah. That, that's negotiable, though. But this, there are two main problems with our immigration system, our legal immigration system, and one is that it's not focused on skills enough, and two, the portion that does focus on skills is really poorly designed. Only 13 percent of people coming into the country have anything to do with like an economic case, and only half of those actually are merit-based, so like 6.5 6 percent or something like that. So having a, an immigration system that matches more like with what Canada does or Australia does, that's actually just long overdue. The stats, if you look at them, legal immigrants in the U.S., new green card recipients, you look at, uh, there's no stats for 2016 as of yet, but 2015 back, about 1,051,000, these are green card, new green card recipients. So you look at how many green card holders are here in the U.S., this goes back to 2014, 13,200,000. Uh, Charles, a big issue and uh, one that the White House thinks they can have a win on? And it's long overdue. I think if you make the case, it's an easy one to make, and it would really prevail. It would take time, but you have to make the case. Look, this is, I love the hypocrisy of the liberals who are so shocked by this. People who sort of swoon over Canada's uh, progressivism with its national health care, and its uh, matinee star liberal prime minister who want him to be the leader here. All of a sudden, when the U.S. proposes essentially the Canadian system, the merit-based system, are shocked at how mean and racist it is. This is a no-brainer. We, here's the analogy. The United States is the place everybody wants to go, every immigrant. You find somebody on a raft on the South China Sea, where they want to go, United States. We have the top 100 draft picks of the NBA, and instead we choose to pick people randomly out of the Karachi phone book. This does not make sense. We should be doing what Canada and Australia are doing and cashing in on the fact that the world wants to come here. This is so obvious, it's almost amazing that we haven't done this. And that, I think, is the core of the issue. You saw Senator Tom Cotton there, also along the president's side there at the White House, uh, Georgia's Senator David Perdue. There are priorities, health care tax, there are a lot of other things you know, uh, that we're working on, but we're starting the process. We're going to work with both sides, and, and right now, with the popularity of this system in Canada and in Australia, we think this should be a bipartisan effort. Michael?
Evans, it's going to be a bipartisan effort, and it, it is going to be a tough sell legislatively. There aren't going to be any Democrats on board. You're already seeing some Republicans complain, Lindsey Graham, uh, and uh, as one example, and you have uh, business groups and economists who are saying this may not be the right solution for the economy. Uh, we can argue about that. I do think it's interesting to see at a time when Donald Trump is has had some setbacks. He's had to swallow this bill on Russia sanctions, which we may talk about later. And of course, we saw the kind of fiasco that health care uh, re reform turned into for him. You know, in the last week or so, we've seen the transgender military ban done by tweet may not actually happen. Possible challenge to college affirmative action policies, which the New York Times reported overnight. And now this move on legal Im immigration. I think you're seeing Trump really uh, taking some steps that are going to be really popular with his base, and particularly that part of the Trump coalition that people refer to as sort of populist, nationalist, going back to that idea of Americans who have been left behind, who have uh, gotten a raw deal in the economy, um, workers, particularly in the Rust Belt and some of those states that he snatched from Hillary Clinton, uh, feeling like uh, nobody's looking out for them. And I think uh, this kind of uh, proposal uh, really plays to that audience. And, you know, in particular, I'm struck, you know, I, I see this kind of like Steve Miller, who we saw uh, uh, talking about this legislation, and Steve Bannon, uh, who are really proponents of this vision in the White House, you know, I, I hear their voices when Trump says in that soundbite that you played, which I think was the critical one, that this legislation will not only restore our competitive edge in the 21st century, but will restore the sacred bonds of trust between America and its citizens. Really kind of touching on a larger theme of national identity uh, and populist nationalism that I think uh, is going to be very politically good uh, with his base at a time when he really needs them. So in your list, I just want to point out the New York Times story is there's a pushback hard by the Justice Department and the White House that this was not anything that they're doing on, on that uh, college thing. But the rest of the list, you're right, they haven't had any uh, big successes legislatively. Can they get one with this? And what Democrats are going to sign on to this effort? Well, that's the, you're absolutely right, Michael, that the problem is that the two groups that are going to be coming out most hard against this will be big businesses and corporations that benefit the most from low-skilled import, importation of, of low-wage workers, low-skilled low and low-wage workers, and then also politically on the left. That's the group that benefits the most politically from our current immigration policy. So who fights so, this? Chamber of Commerce? I, I would, I'd assume that many of the corporations will, yeah, pu will push all of their Republican members. Having said that, most of what our current immigration system does is benefit the elites. It benefits people who are already well connected. These are the people who suffer the least from our immigration policy, whereas the rest of the country where you're actually interacting with some of the problems that come from not having a solid immigration policy, whether it's at hospitals or schools or whatnot, these are the people who have been crying out and been shut down for decades asking for a better immigration policy. So I just speak of interaction. I just want to play some of the interaction from the the White House briefing room uh, with Stephen Miller, which was interesting. This whole notion of, well, they could learn, you know, they have to learn English before they get to the United States. Are we just going to bring in people from Great Britain and Australia? I am shocked at your statement that you think that only people from Great Britain and Australia would know English. It's actually, it reveals your cosmopolitan uh, bias to a shocking degree. It sounds like so you're trying to engineer the I racial say, and ethnic flow of people into this country. That Policy. is one of the most outrageous, insulting, ignorant, and foolish things you've ever said. I asked you for a statistic. Can you tell me but how many... The, how maybe many, we'll make a carve-out in the bill yeah. that says the New York Times can hire all the low-skilled, less-paid workers they want from other countries and see how you feel then about low-wage substitution. This is a reality that's happening in our country. No, maybe it's time we had compassion, Glenn, for American workers. So Stephen Miller was uh, bringing the heat there. Yeah, I think he won that round. Uh, it is kind of weird to believe that the only people who speak English are Englishmen and Australians. Look, the fact is that a high, you know, a high level of unskilled uh, immigrants, some legal, some illegal, are going to depress wages. That's not a, it's not a complicated economic theory. Here's the irony. The irony is that the pushback is going to come from the Chamber of Commerce, who I think you, you could appease by having a guest worker program, as Reagan did, and then the limousine liberals on the left, who don't suffer, in fact, who gain by having low-skilled uh, people uh, doing their lawns and looking after their children. The people who suffer from illegal immigration, depression of wages, are particularly those who are the less educated, and it is only white to rust the belt workers. 
it's African Americans, it's Hispanic immigrants, legal Hispanic immigrants, and I think we ought to face up to the fact that if you really want to help the wage stagnation in the country, one way to do it is to not have a flood of low-wage workers, unskilled workers who compete with Americans. That's, that's kind of uncomplicated.